Good morning and a very warm welcome to our morning worship here in Peterhead Congregational Church. Can I wish you all uh, a very happy Christmas wherever you're joining us from and we hope and pray that you've had a, a good family time over the, the last few days. We come this morning to gather around God's Word on this first Sunday after Christmas and at this evening um, on YouTube at, at six o'clock there will be an evening service and that will be a Sankey praise night and that will be as we say on um, this evening at six o'clock. The psalmist writes, for he will deliver the needy who will cry out, the afflicted who will have no one to help. He will take pity on the weak and the needy and save them from death. And he will rescue them from oppression and from violence. For precious is their blood in his sight. Let's worship God together and sing to his praise and his glory. O come all ye faithful, joyful and triumphant. And the words are on your screen.
Let's pray together. Let's all pray. God our Father, we thank you for this time of celebration, this time when we can meet together, gathering together as we are this morning, although not physically in this place, coming to, to meet with you, to bring our praise and worship on this Christmas Sunday. And we thank you, Lord, for all the hope and the promise of your word, for all that we're reminded about in your word. We thank you for the way in which your word tells so clearly to us the story of your plan to put your son, Jesus Christ, into the midst of your people, that we might indeed have redemption and salvation through him. We thank you, Lord, for the opportunity of, of spending time this Christmas season in the middle of all the pandemic that's going around us, but still being able to share a bit with family and, and, and how important that is for so many folk. We pray, Lord, that in the midst of all our, our, our meeting together and sharing together, that you would guard and bless and keep us and help us always to remain watchful in these days. Lord, we joy when we come to your word, the way in which your word reminds us of the humble circumstances in which you chose to bring forth your son into this world. Help us to live lives that are humble. Help us to live lives, not <coughs> lives full of ourselves, <coughs> but instead, help us to be still and quiet before you and to seek to give glory to your name, to your will, and to your purpose. Now, Lord, as we come to worship you today, we would seek your forgiveness in our lives. Lord, we confess that we have strayed from the path, the narrow path that we should be walking on. And we've strayed away from that and wandered here and there and, and forgotten that you call us to walk in your light and in your love. So help us today to throw off all the shackles of this world that would tie us down and help us to follow you and to walk in the light and the love of the Lord Jesus Christ. Forgive us our sins, Lord, in accordance with your will, as only you can forgive. And restore us, leading us through repentance into your forgiveness that cleanses us in every way and help us and set our feet upon that pathway that would lead us to you. On this last Sunday of this year, looming before us as the start of a new year, filled with new opportunity and new hope, and we pray, Father, that you would bless us as we come through this year of difficulty and trial and pestilence. May we indeed see, seek and find the light of Jesus Christ in our hearts and in our lives. Now we would ask that you would remain with us, that you would be in all that we would seek to do and say, for we would ask it all, in Jesus' name, who taught us to pray together and to say, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever. 
Amen. <clears throat> we would sing again our next carol, See amid the winter snow born for us on earth below, and the words are on the screen.
Now we turn to God's Word. And our scripture reading this morning is taken from the New Testament, from the Gospel, according to Matthew, Matthew chapter 2, and we read from verse 1. Matthew chapter 2, reading from verse 1. Hear the Word of God. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea, during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, Where is the one who has been born King of the Jews? We saw his star in the east and have come to worship him. When King Herod heard this, he was disturbed, and all Jerusalem with him. When he had called together all the people's chief priests and teachers of the law, he asked them where the Christ was to be born. In Bethlehem, in Judea, they replied, For this is what the prophet has written, But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For out of you will come a ruler who is to be the shepherd of my people, Israel. Then Herod called the Magi secretly and found out from them the exact time the star had appeared. He sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and make careful search for the child. As soon as you find him, report to me so that I too may go and worship him. After they had heard the king, they went on their way, and the star that had been seen in the east went ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were overjoyed. On coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary, and they bowed down and worshipped him. Then they opened their treasures and presented him with gifts of gold and of incense and of myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they returned to their country by another route. When they had gone, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream. Get up, he said. Take the child and his mother and escape to Egypt. Stay there until I tell you, for Herod is going to search for a child to, to kill him. So he got up, took the child and his mother during the night, and they left for Egypt, where they stayed until the death of Herod. And so was fulfilled what the Lord had said through the prophet, Out of Egypt. I called my son. When Herod realized that he had been outwitted by the Magi, he was furious, and he gave orders to kill all the boys in Bethlehem and its vicinity who were two years old and under in accordance with the time he had learned from the Magi when what was said through the prophet Jeremiah was fulfilled. A voice is heard in Ramah, weeping and great mourning, Rachel weeping for her children and refusing to be comforted because they are no more. Amen. And may the Lord add his blessing to this reading of his word and to his name be all glory and praise. We come now to our prayers of intercession and of thanksgiving, shall we pray together? God our Father, so many things that we could pray for this morning, but firstly, surely, we give you thanks that you have brought us thus far through this year, brought us to the very end of this year, and set our feet upon the footsteps to lead us into a new year in accordance with your will. We thank you today for all those who are working in hospitals, those who are 
working in intensive care units and, and in other wards, working, continuing to battle against the coronavirus. And Lord, you know the difficulty and the trials of many people. You know that some people can have this and have no signs and others are, are very, very seriously ill. We, we thank you for all the skills that have been placed into the hands of, of men and women as they seek to, to serve and to make us better. We thank you, Lord, for those who have thus far received the vaccine. And we pray that as we move forward, the vaccine will continue to be rolled out across our country to protect many, many people. Lord, but not only those who are in hospital with this illness, but we also pray for folks who are in hospital and who are waiting to go in for operations and procedures that have been cancelled because of coronavirus. So we pray for all those who are waiting, that their waiting time will indeed be brought forward and that they will soon be able to, to go and, and to be helped there. We thank you for those who are caring in our nursing homes, for those who are home carers who move from one house to the other and how difficult that is and we pray for all of them that you would keep them safe in their work we pray for the residents in our care and nursing homes and for those who are being cared for at home that there too that your hand and blessing might reach and touch each and every one of them we pray father for those who are in authority over us who in this past year have had to make decisions that no governments have ever had to make before. We pray and give thanks, Lord, for your guidance and your lead. And we, we pray, Father, that we will all remember that, that everyone has been walking in darkness here hoping and waiting and trusting that they're doing the right thing. And we thank you, Lord, for your hand seen in the midst of all of this. Lord, we, we, we pray that as we turn into the new year that we will soon be able to open the front doors of this church and to gather for worship again. We have sought not to do that in, in accordance with your will. But we pray that we might soon be able to do that, to meet and to share and to sing and to worship and to have fellowship one with the other. So we pray that normality might soon come back into our lives. We remember those who are alone at this time, those who have spent the, the Christmas period on their own. And we pray, Father, that you would draw near to all who are on their own at this time. Draw near and build them up and strengthen them and encourage them through these days. We pray for the life and the witness of our church that we would continue to do all that we can in reaching out into our community and serving your will and your purpose. We thank you for the opportunity that we've been given throughout this, this present year, week by week, to bring the truth of the gospel into the homes of people all over this land and beyond. And we pray that you would continue to allow us to do that. Lord, in all that we do, we seek not to glorify ourselves, but to glorify your holy name. We pray for the organizations of the church, for the children of the church, for all the various groups that are in abeyance at this time. And we pray that there too, our full and active life might soon be
be restored to us in your will. Now we remember those who have lost loved ones, and we pray, Father, that your presence would be with them. We pray for our funeral directors, uh, for Robert Mackey and his staff at this time, that you would continue to bless them and help them through these hard and difficult days. And we pray for all who need your help and your encouragement. Lord, for our families and for our friends, we give you thanks. And we pray your blessing on each and every one of them. If there are any who do not know you, then we pray that you will bring them to a saving knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. Mighty God, in a moment's silence now, we would bring our own prayers and petitions to you. Lord, for all those who work day and night to provide us with the essentials that we need, for those who are at sea, for those who are going to sea, for those who guard our shores, for those who police our streets, for all in the emergency services, we pray that you would bless them. For those who are far away from you this, this day, we pray that you would take hold of them and bring them nearer to you. For those who have no shelter, we pray that room might be found. And we pray, Father, that we might be able to do our part in assisting others. Lord, we commend our prayers to you now in and through the precious name of Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, not our will be done, but yours, O Lord. Amen. The hymn before the sermon, In the bleak midwinter frosty wind made moan, and the words are on your screen.
Let's pray together. Let's all pray. God our Father, as we turn our thoughts now to your word, so we pray that you would open up this word to us. We pray that you would teach us your truth, build us up and strengthen us and prepare us for life every day. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. As we come to this passage from the second chapter of Matthew's Gospel, well, there's a lot in, in what we read today. For you and I, Christmas is a time when we can meet with people and share with people, when we can meet and we can gather and worship and bring our worship and praise to God. This year, we've had to do that in a different way by putting, as you know, our two Christmas Eve services and so on online because the church remains closed at this point. But nonetheless, we can still worship wherever we are. We can still know that as we sing and as we join together in our own homes, we are joining with our brothers and sisters in Christ, singing and praising God. Now, as we come to this passage today, it's not perhaps the, the kind of... Um, glowing, happy, family-type passage that, that we often read at this time because there's, there's quite a lot of intrigue and there's, there's some, um, a desire to, to kill the baby Jesus right at the very beginning of his life because of the, the magi, the, the wise men, the kings, whoever they might be, it doesn't matter who they were. And of course, there's all these legends that come up that, that, they were, that gives us their name and so on. But the scripture doesn't name them because, of course, they have a part to play. But like you and I, we have a part to play. But their part is to do the will of God and come and bring their gifts and themselves before Christ and to come through and speak with Herod and so on and so forth because nothing has been left to chance here. The foreordained plan of God is being worked out as we read this passage. Herod's a, a weak man. He is not... Um, the king, he has been given the, the, a, a, a tetrach, a kingdom, an area to rule over. But he's not the king that he thought he would be. And therefore he always has to seek to please those who are in authority, namely the Roman governor and the Caesar in Rome. For ultimately, they are the rulers of the land at this time. And into this whole situation, the Christ child is born. And we begin at chapter 2, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea, during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east. Now we've moved on a wee bit. I know that our nativity scenes... And if we were doing a nativity play here today, as we've done in the past, and as was took place last week, then the, there'll be kings and so on bringing their, 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 their gifts to the Christ child. But this passage teaches us the importance of reading the word. Because it doesn't say, and they went to the stable, it says that they came to the house where Jesus and Mary were. Because a bit of time has elapsed. The star appeared in the sky over the stable, and the shepherds were in the field and they, they saw the star. But the wise men, these magi, 
have followed the star all the way. And the scripture clearly teaches us here that time has elapsed. Indeed, even when Herod speaks to them and when he decides to do what he's going to do at the end and he says to, to his, um, his men that when they go to slaughter these innocent children that they had to be children that were two years old and under. So a decent period of time has passed. And that's because the star appeared in the sky there for two years before the baby Jesus was born. These men have been traveling for two years to come. Now, you know, that's a, a big thing to do. Now, this is not some kind of new interpretation of the scripture that I'm giving you. This is what the scripture says. It's not me that says it, it's the word itself. And because we see nativity plays and all these other things, or if you've got a Christmas crib or, or whatever you might have, if you've a nativity set in the house, you'll have all these things round about it that, that, that show that picture. But the scripture is what we are interested in here. Not what people think, what the Word says. And the Word tells us this because there's an importance in what's being said. I said earlier that the preordained plan of God is being worked out here. And Herod, of course, at verse 3, that we, re we hear that when Herod heard this, that is, that the star was there, that the Magi had come and they were looking for the, the king who would be born. That Herod was disturbed. But not only Herod. The scripture says that when King Herod heard this, he was disturbed and all Jerusalem with him. It wasn't just Herod that was concerned. It would appear that the whole city was concerned. Concerned that there should be a king. Now maybe their concern wasn't so much about the fact that a new king was born. Maybe the word concern can still be, well the word concern certainly can be used in, in relation to the people's desire waiting on the birth of a Messiah. They were concerned to hear this they wanted to know more. And so you see it threatened Herod and his position, which he longed to have. And so he's sleek it, as we would say here in Scotland. He's sleek it. And he decides that he wants to speak to the Magi. And he asks them about what they're doing. And they, they give him as much information as they've got. And he says to them, when you go and you find the child, come back and tell me that I may go and worship him. What if he was that interested, why didn't he go? Why didn't he get up off his throne and go with them at that very moment? Instead, he had a wicked plan in his heart. And God, who sees into the depths of all our hearts, could see into the depths of Herod's heart. And his heart was dark. And so the men leave and they make their way uh, to Bethlehem and they, they get there and they find at the house that uh, Mary and the baby Jesus. And they bring forth their gifts of gold and, and frankincense and the precious and expensive gifts and you know if we stop and think about those gifts for a wee moment and you think about how precious they were the most precious gifts perhaps that these men could give gold frankincense and myrrh perfume an ointment and a bag of precious metal that, that men would kill for in this world. And yet, 
There was none of it, really, that was even fitting for the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords because there was none of it that his Father, that God, had not made in the beginning. There was nothing new. There was nothing different. Everything that was handed over was already his, is what I'm saying. Everything. What, of course, God wanted were the hearts of men, not just their, their offerings, which all came from him, as we said in the first place. And as they hand over these precious gifts, if we just think for a moment about the, the adult life of Jesus, and he had no home to call his own, and he walked about, it would appear in the clothes that he had on his back, and he had nothing else to take with him. Nothing. Wherever he stayed, he stayed where people would give him a place to stay. Wherever he went to, he relied on the hospitality of others, or they slept in the desert, or wherever it might be. He had no place to call his own. And all these precious gifts that were handed over reminds us that he did not have a, a pile of wealth sitting somewhere because he did not need wealth. All he needed was his continual trust in his Father. And so as we go back to the men and the, they, they are warned in a dream. And, and dreams are important in the early part of Matthew's Gospel because there's dreams before Mary. There's dreams for Elizabeth. There's dreams for Joseph. There's dreams where God intervenes, breaks through, touches into the hearts and the lives of men and women to give them his will. To show them his will and his purpose. If we look back to the Old Testament prophecies, there the scripture would say, and the word of the Lord came to whatever prophet it was. In other words, they were, they were almost lifted up from where they were and shown something. And here that's the same thing, only it's at night when they're sleeping. And as they sleep, God speaks to their hearts and to their minds. And to those three wise men, well, sorry, to the wise men, because we don't know that there was three. There was three gifts. There could have been 300 wise men for all we know. It doesn't matter. What matters was that these magi, these kings, these wise people came, followed, and, and, and did, played their part in the purpose of God. It doesn't matter how many of them there were, as I said, or where they came from, what countries they were from, or what each one brought, or what their names were. It is of no importance whatsoever. Only that they came and they bowed down before the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what's important in this whole passage and indeed in the scripture and after the, in a dream the, an angel of God had spoken to them and they were warned not to go back and tell Herod the things that, that he had asked them that sleek it way come and tell me that I might go and worship him come and tell me what he really meant was so that I might go and rid the world of this Christ child that's what he was looking to do. And from that message, we go to another message immediately. And the other message is that message that is given in a dream to Joseph. To tell Joseph to get up and waken up and get up and take his wife and his child and leave and go to Egypt. Now think about that. What is it we read throughout the whole of the Old Testament about the, the children of Israel? 
that God brought them forth out of the land of Egypt and out of the house of bondage. And here, what's happening? Go to Egypt. Go back to where your people once were. And so they leave and they go back. And it's done so that, so that in Matthew's gospel, Matthew is able to show forth what the Old Testament prophet says. And Matthew here quotes from the prophet Micah, but you Bethlehem in the land of Judah are by no means least among the rulers of Judah, for out of you will come a ruler who will be a shepherd to my people Israel. And later, as it would say, and out of Egypt I will call my son and that Old Testament prophecy from the Old Testament referred to the, the same journey that Moses would have. Moses brought out of Egypt to lead the children of Israel. And here Christ being brought out of Egypt to lead the children of Israel. Nothing is mistaken here. Everything is there to fit together. You know, like... like I, I'm not very good at doing jigsaws. In fact, I don't have any patience for them. You, you know, you see the picture on the front of the box and you open it up and there's maybe 500 or 1,000 uh, or, or maybe even more pieces. And, and I stand and look at them and I have absolutely no patience to think that I could put this picture together. I was speaking to a friend of mine on the phone the other night and she said to me I've just finished a jigsaw and there is one piece missing I bet you how many of you I wonder have had that experience there was one piece missing and I can't find it and three days later I was speaking to her again and she said I found it it had fallen down on the floor at the back of the leg of the table but by that time she'd broken the jigsaw up and put it back in the box again and I never asked her, was she going to rebuild it? I'm sure she won't. You see, there are no pieces missing in this story. The whole story is given to us so that we don't need to make up bits or put bits in so that what we are given is the complete picture of God's will and his purpose for you and for me. And Mary and Joseph... And the baby Jesus go to away to, to um, Egypt. And Herod then realizes that he's been duped. But he's not convinced that Mary and Joseph and the Christ child have gone because he doesn't know who Mary and Joseph and Jesus are. Had he gone with the, the kings, or with the Magi, sorry, had he gone with the Magi, then he would have seen him, but he didn't go. Instead, he stayed back. And so he had no idea who they were, what they looked like, or anything like that. And so we have that terrible ordeal or, or when they go and leave. The ordeal when the, the terrible order that he issues to go and take the life of every boy. When he, verse 16, when Herod realized that he had been outwitted by the Magi, he was furious and he gave orders to kill all the boys in Bethlehem and in its vicinity who were two years old and under in accordance with the time he had learned from the Magi. He sent them out to kill these innocents, two years of age and under. Why? Because he was terrified for himself. He was terrified that this baby could remove him from his throne. And the reality is, friends, for every king, for every queen, for every ruler, for every person in authority all over this world, 
We are here for a limited time and then God in his grace and mercy calls us wherever he chooses and puts us wherever he chooses. And at that moment, when we stand before him, we have to give an account of who we are in relation to our relationship with him. Not about whether or not we've stood in a pulpit or we've been in charge of this many people or we've been a great and mighty ruler of some nation or many nations. Because none of that is of any importance when we stand before the Lord. Only our relationship, yours and mine, with the Lord Jesus Christ. That's a sobering thought. You know, as Christians, we can often judge this person or that person. We can often have an opinion on people here, there, and everywhere. Yet, yet, we have to remember, as the scripture says, by the way in which you and I look at others, we will be looked at. However we judge others, so shall we be judged. And that is a sobering thought. Think of that. Think of the times when you've decided you'll not speak to this person or that person or the next one. Or you'll not have anything to do with this, that or the next thing. What happens when God says to us, why did you do that? Because the scripture says, whatever you do unto the least of these, thou doest also unto me. And there's, these are there to remind us. You and I, every day they're there to remind us that we are not lording it over anyone. That we are here to serve our God and to serve his will and his purpose. So the innocents are to be slaughtered. Blood spilt needlessly. At the whim of a wicked ruler. But also done because the scripture says. In Jeremiah. A voice is heard in Ramah. Ra weep, Rachel weeping in great mourning, Rachel weeping for her children and refusing to be comforted because they are no more. Now, in the opening part of Matthew's Gospel, there are seven pieces of prophecy that are used. In the opening chapter, seven times, he refers back to the Old Testament and he does that because as Matthew writes his gospel, he writes it to convince those in the Jewish tradition that the Messiah was born that day. And the best way to, he believes, the best way to bring those who are of, in, in the Jewish faith into Christianity is to show them what the Old Testament prophets had to say. And therefore he does that seven times to prove that this is the Messiah. Now for you and I today, we don't need to prove to anyone our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. But we do need, as I said, to stand before the Lord with our faith. And when we stand before him, we must be able to give an account of the faith that lies within us. Because that faith that lies within us is all important. All important that for you and for me, we might indeed share our faith fully in this life, but in particularly before the Lord, that we can show that we have remained faithful to him every day. Every one of us fails in one way or another. Every day we get it wrong one way or another. But that doesn't leave us hopeless. And 
Instead, that leaves us with such encouragement because our God never leaves us or forsakes us. He remains ever present, ever steady, ever willing to carry us through and to take us into his eternal kingdom. We are about to turn in a few days' time, God willing, into a new year. Surely, as we come to that new year, we will all have the same thought, asking God that this year will be better than the year that we have lived in. Yet, even in the midst of all the trials and all the tribulations, in the midst of loss and sadness, in the midst of this pandemic. What about all the blessings that you and I have received every day? How quickly we forget the blessings of God poured out in our lives. How quickly we focus on all the things that are wrong. So as we step forward now looking towards this new year let's put our hope and our trust in the only one who knows what tomorrow will bring in Jesus Christ your Lord and Saviour shall we pray together God our Father, we thank you for this message of hope. This message that shows us that your plans cannot be thwarted by men. For you can see and you know the depths of our hearts. Gracious God, lead us and guide us in all your ways. Lead us and guide us in the days that are before us. And as that in a few days' time we move into a new year, take us into that new year, not with hearts that are sore and heavy, but with hearts that are praising and worshipping your holy name. For we would ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Now we would conclude our service this morning by singing together our closing hymn, Good Christian men rejoice with heart and soul and voice. Give ye heed to what we say, Jesus Christ is born today. The words are on your screen.
Thou may the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit rest upon you and upon your homes, upon all whom you love in this place and elsewhere, this day and for evermore.